Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, welcome to the reading of this week's lesson. It's from the series on the Book of John, written by E. Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. Today's lesson is titled Signs That Point the Way, and it's ready for teaching on October 5, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 28. And to introduce our series of lessons this quarter, we have Dr. E. Edward Zinke, who is a former Associate Director for the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and is involved with many church activities and boards, including serving as Vice Chair of the LNG White Estate Board and as a Senior Advisor for Adventist Review Ministries. He has a Master of Divinity degree from Andrews University and also holds three honorary doctorate degrees from Seventh-day Adventist universities. He lives in Maryland in the USA. The co-author of these lessons is Dr. Thomas Shepard, who is Senior Research Professor of New Testament at the Andrews University Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, where he has taught since 2008. He and his wife, Dr. Sherry Shepard, M.D., have served as missionaries in Malawi, Africa and Brazil. They have two grown children and six grandchildren. Now you'll remember that Dr. Shepard wrote the lessons on the book of Mark for last quarter. Firstly, I will read the first page of the introduction to the series and then Dr. Zenke. Sitting in a shop in Tehran, Iran, the Persian rug depicted an ancient forest. Beautifully done, it recreated a scene in Switzerland, mountains, a waterfall, a turquoise lake, forested hillsides, and an expansive blue sky dotted with clouds. Anyone in that shop could have spent their time noting the details, the number of knots per square inch, the fabric of the carpet, the types of dye used, all the minutiae that resulted in the rug. Or the person could have focused instead on the arresting techniques and themes that gave the carpet its unique beauty. The sky reflected in the lake, the snow that capped the mountains, the verdant forest complemented by the deep green moss. The themes of the carpet combined with one another in a deftly coordinated display of beauty to manifest the splendour of that serene spot in the Alps. This quarter we will be studying another finely crafted masterpiece. This work is not the result of a brush on canvas, a precisely framed photograph, or a skillfully woven carpet. Rather, it is the Word of God as artfully expressed in the Gospel of John. Words have meaning within their contexts. For anyone to understand what Scripture intends to say, it must be studied in context. The immediate sentences, chapters, and sections and the overall message of the Bible itself. Finally, because the entire Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, each part should be studied in the context of the whole. But now to Dr. E. Edward Zinke. Themes in the Gospel of John The intention of this quarter will be to understand the message of John's Gospel. It is unique among the four Gospels, often focusing attention on personal interviews between Jesus and just one or two people, such as Nathaniel, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, the man born blind, Lazarus and his sisters, Pilate, Peter, and Thomas. Many of these stories appear only in John. The Gospel of John is the Word of God conveyed to us through the Apostle. As with the entire Bible, the Gospel came by the will of God rather than by the will of humankind. John was merely the willing instrument that the Holy Spirit used to convey many crucial themes. The Word, Light, Bread, Water, the Holy Spirit, Oneness, Signs, Testimony, and Prophecy. These themes mutually enhance and illumine one another throughout the Gospel. 
Bible study often concentrates on the meaning of a word or a small passage of Scripture. We check the meaning of the word in the Bible dictionary. We examine the grammar, the immediate context, and the historical context. And using our analogy of the carpet, we get caught up in the examination of the number of knots per square inch, the fabric, the dyes, and the backing. All of these details are important, but let us not miss the big picture while examining the details. Indeed, just as the Persian carpet could transport someone to that beautiful Alpine scene, so may the Gospel of John carry us back to the life and ministry of Jesus, whom to know is life eternal. The details have a role, which is to point us toward the big picture, and in John that picture is a divinely inspired revelation of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that at the beginning of this quarter, as you begin the study of the book of John, that we can come before you. Lord, each one of us is a sinner, but fortunately for us, you have provided the way of salvation through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And this quarter, as we study more about him in the book of John, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us, to bless us, to show us what you want us to know, but also to draw us closer to you. Lord, today I'd like to pray for those who are listening by themselves somewhere, those who are listening to the reading of this Sabbath school lesson and have no one else to commune with but themselves and you. I pray that they may feel comfort and that they may feel hope because of what is read here this week. And I'd also like to pray for Kirkland King and his family, including Aunt Naomi, who's in Jamaica, for Daisy from Malawi in Africa and her family, and for Hope Bennett in Ontario in Canada, and Cordelia Castorina. And I don't know where Cordelia is, Lord, but I just pray that today and this week that she may be blessed and that the study of your word, as for each one of us, may be a blessing. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let's read that again, John 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did John write this gospel? Did he wish to emphasize Jesus' miracles or some specific teachings of Jesus? What was the reason for writing what he did? Under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, John explains why. He says that though many more things could be written about the life of Christ, and he writes this in verse 25 of John chapter 21. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. The stories he included were written in order that you may believe, as he writes in John 20 verse 31, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This week, we're going to look at John's account of some of Jesus' early miracles, from his turning water to wine at a wedding, to restoring to health someone's very sick son, to the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. John calls these miracles signs, he does not mean something like a street sign, but rather a miraculous event that points toward a deeper reality. Jesus as the Messiah. In all these accounts, we see examples of people who responded by faith, and their examples invite us to do the same.
Sunday, September 29, The Wedding at Cana Read John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. What sign did Jesus do at Cana, and how did this help his disciples in coming to believe in him? Let's read that in John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Seeing Jesus perform the miracle of changing the water into wine provided evidence in favour of the disciples' decision to follow Jesus. How could it not have been a powerful sign pointing to him as being someone from God? They probably were not yet ready to understand that he was God. Moses was the leader of the Israelites, and he brought Israel out of Egypt by many signs and wonders— as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 22, Before our eyes the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. And Deuteronomy 26 verse 28, So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He was the one whom God used to free Israel from the Egyptians. He was, in a sense, their saviour. God prophesied through Moses that a prophet would come who was like Moses. God asked Israel to hear him. As we read in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to to him. And Matthew 17, verse 5, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Acts 7, verse 37, This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. That prophet was Jesus, and in John chapter 2, Jesus performed this first sign, which itself pointed back to the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. The river Nile was a key resource and a deity for the Egyptians. One of the plagues was directed at the river, the changing of its waters to blood. At Cana, Jesus performed a similar miracle, but instead of turning water into blood, he turned it into wine. The water came from six water pots used for purification purposes in Jewish rituals, linking the miracle even more closely to biblical themes of salvation. By recounting the incident of changing the water to wine and thus referring back to Exodus, John was pointing to Jesus as our deliverer. What did the master of the feast think of the unfermented wine that Jesus provided? He was indeed surprised by the quality of the drink, and, not knowing the miracle that Jesus had performed there, thought that they had saved the best for last. 
The Greek word oinos, O-I-N-O-S, is used both for fresh and fermented grape juice, as we read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Dictionary on page 1177. Ellen G. White states that the juice produced by the miracle was not alcoholic. And that's in the chapter At the Marriage Feast, The Desire of Ages, page 149. No doubt those who knew what happened were astonished at what had taken place. And so to finish the day, what are your reasons for following Jesus? We have been given many, haven't we? Monday, September 30, the second sign in Galilee. All through his earthly ministry, Jesus performed miracles that helped people believe in him. John recorded these miracles so that others would believe in Jesus as well. Read John chapter 4, verses 46 to 54. Why does the evangelist make a connection back to the miracle at the wedding feast? John chapter 4, beginning at verse 46. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. In giving an account of the second sign that Jesus did in Galilee, John points back to the first sign at the wedding in Cana. John seems to be saying, the signs that Jesus did will help you see who Jesus is. Then John adds, this sign is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee, and that was verse 54. At first, Jesus' response to the nobleman's plea may seem harsh, yet this official had made the healing of his son the criterion for believing in Jesus. Jesus read his heart and pinpointed the spiritual sickness that was more profound than his son's life-threatening illness. Like a lightning bolt from the blue sky, the man suddenly recognized that his spiritual poverty could cost the life of his son. It is important to recognize that miracles, in and of themselves, do not prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Others have performed miracles, some were true prophets, others false. Miracles reveal only the existence of the supernatural. They don't, by themselves, mean that God must be the one doing them. Satan can perform miracles, if by the word miracles we mean supernatural acts. The nobleman, in anguish, cast himself on Jesus' mercy, pleading with him to heal his son. Jesus' response was reassuring. He said, Go, your son will live, in verse 50. The verb will live, in Greek, is actually in the present tense. This usage is called a futuristic present, where a future event is spoken of with such certainty as if it were already happening. The man did not rush home, but Believing Jesus got home the next day, finding that exactly when Jesus had said these words, the fever left his son. 
What a powerful reason to believe in Jesus. And so to finish the day, even if we were to see a miracle, what other criteria must we look at before automatically assuming it is from God? Tuesday, October 1. The Miracle at the Pool of Bethesda. The next sign John records took place at the Pool of Bethesda. We read about that in John 5 verses 1 to 9 and we'll do that shortly. It was believed that an angel caused movement in the water and that the first sick person to enter the water would be healed. As a result, the porches of the pool were crowded with those hoping to be cured at the next occurrence. Jesus went to Jerusalem, and as he passed by the pool, he saw the waiting throng. What a sight it must have been, too. All these people, some surely quite ill, waiting and waiting by the water for a cure that surely will not come. What an opportunity for Jesus. Read John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. And the question we'll ask is, because anyone by the pool obviously wanted to get well, why did Jesus ask the paralytic if he wanted to be healed in verse 6? Let's read John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. When one has been sick for a long time, the sickness becomes the norm. And, strange as it may seem, it can sometimes be a bit disturbing to leave the disability behind. The man implies in his answer that he wants healing. The problem is that he is looking for it in the wrong place, while the one who made man's legs is standing right in front of him. Little did the man know who was talking to him, although after the healing he might have started to understand that Jesus was indeed someone very special. We read in The Desire of Ages, page 202 and 203, Jesus does not ask this sufferer to exercise faith in him. He simply says, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. But the man's faith takes hold upon that word. Every nerve and muscle thrills with new life and healthful action comes to his crippled limbs. Without question, he sets his will to obey the command of Christ, and all his muscles respond to his will. Springing to his feet, he finds himself an active man. Jesus had given him no assurance of divine help. The man might have stopped to doubt and lost his one chance of healing. But he believed Christ's word, and in acting upon it, he received strength. End of quote. And that brings us to our question for today. Jesus later encountered the man in the temple and said, You have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you, in verse 14. What is the relationship between sickness and sin? And why must we understand that not all sickness is a direct result of specific sins in our life? Wednesday, October 2, Hard Hearts Signs, wonders and miracles in and of themselves don't prove that something is of God. But, on the other hand, 
When they are of God, it's a dangerous thing to reject them. Read John chapter 5, verses 10 to 16. What lessons can we take away from the amazing hardness of the religious leaders' hearts in regard to Jesus and the miracle he had just performed? John chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. When Jesus revealed himself to the man who had been healed, the man immediately told the religious leaders that it was Jesus. One would think this would be a time to praise God, but instead the leaders persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath, John 5.16. Healings were allowed on the Sabbath only in an emergency. This man had been disabled for 38 years, thus his healing was hardly an emergency. And then too, what was the necessity of having him take up his bed? One would think that someone with the power from God to perform such a miracle would also know if it was permissible to carry a mat home on the Sabbath day. Clearly, Jesus was seeking to take them to a deeper biblical truths beyond the man-made rules and regulations that had, in some cases, stifled true faith. What do these other accounts teach about how spiritually and hard people had become, regardless of the evidence? Well, we'll read these accounts in John 9, verses 1 to 16. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. And then we read in Mark chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Baal By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? 
and then Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 14. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you have a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. How could these religious leaders be so blind? The likely answer is that it was because of their own corrupt hearts. Their false belief that the Messiah would deliver them from Rome now and their love of power and lack of surrender to God. All these helped cause them to reject the truth that stood right before them. Read John 5 verses 38 to 42. What was Jesus' warning? What can we learn from these words? That is, what could be in us that blinds us to the truths we need to know and apply to our own lives. John 5, beginning at verse 38. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Thursday, October 3. Jesus Claims The miracle by the pool of Bethesda provided an excellent opportunity for John to emphasize who Jesus is. John takes nine verses to describe the miracle, and about forty verses, as we'll see below, to describe the one who performed the miracle. Read John 5, verses 16 to 18. Why was Jesus persecuted for his action on the Sabbath? John 5, beginning at verse 16. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defence, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. John 5.18 can be disturbing because it seems to say that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. However, a closer look at John 5, verses 16 to 18, which we've just read, shows that Jesus argues that his work on the Sabbath is in line with his relationship to his Father. God does not stop sustaining the universe on the Sabbath. Consequently, Jesus' Sabbath activity was part of his claim to divinity. The religious leaders persecuted him on the basis of supposed Sabbath-breaking and a claim to equality to God. Read John chapter 6, verses 19 to 47. What was Jesus saying in order to help the leaders see him for who he truly is, a claim so powerfully attested by the miracle he had just done? John 5, beginning at verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, Even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. 
Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming, and has now come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear him will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favour, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weighter than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe, since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, of whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you did not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Jesus defends his actions in three steps. First, he explains his intimate relationship with the Father in verses 19 to 30. Jesus indicates that he and his Father act in harmony, to the point that Jesus has the power both to judge and to raise the dead, and we read all about that in verses 25 to 30. Second, Jesus calls four witnesses in rapid succession to his defence. John the Baptist in verses 31 to 35, the miracles Jesus does in verse 36, the Father in verses 37 and 38, and the Scriptures in verse 39. Each of these witnesses gives testimony in favour of Jesus. Finally, in verses 40 to 47, Jesus sets before his accusers their own condemnation, revealing the contrast between his ministry and their self-seeking. Their condemnation, he says, will come from Moses. And that is in verses 45 to 47, the one in whom they have set their hopes. And so to finish today... How can we be careful not to fall into the trap of believing in God, even having correct doctrines, but not surrendering fully to Christ? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Friday, October 4. Further Thought We read in The Desire of Ages, page 203, Jesus had given him, that's the disabled man, no assurance of divine help. The man might have stopped to doubt and lost his one chance of healing, but he believed Christ's word, and in acting upon it, he received strength. 
Through the same faith, we may receive spiritual healing. By sin, we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied. Of ourselves, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man capable of walking. Let these desponding, struggling ones look up. The Saviour is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him, and in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion which, through long indulgence, binds both body and soul, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses, we read in Ephesians 2.1. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. End of quote. And then on page 209, Jesus repelled the charge of blasphemy. My authority, he said, for doing the work of which you accuse me, is that I am the Son of God, one with him in nature, in will, and in purpose. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, reflect upon this week's lesson. Faith was the key that made these healings possible. The leaders, in contrast, revealed the dangers of doubt and unbelief. Why must we not confuse having questions, which we all do, with having doubt? Why are they not the same thing? And why is it important to know the difference between them? Question 2. Look at Thursday's final question. Why, as Seventh-day Adventists, must we be especially careful about this danger? However important, for instance, knowing and even keeping the right Sabbath day or knowing about the state of the dead, why do these truths not save us? What does save us and how? And question three. Look carefully at John 5, 47, which reads, But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? How are those today who, for instance, deny the universality of the flood or the literal six-day creation doing exactly what Jesus warned against here? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Heaviness in a Camp Cabin by Andrew McChesney An eerie heaviness rested on the red wooden cabin as eight Alaska native girls prepared for bed on their first night at Camp Polaris, a Seventh-day Adventist summer camp in southwestern Alaska. All the girls felt it. The cabin's two counsellors felt it. It was an intense feeling of evil and harm. One counsellor, 21-year-old Rachel, was physically exhausted but couldn't sleep. She sensed evil angels were more prevalent than usual. She thought about the eight teens in her cabin. Many of them had been abused, practiced self-harm and struggled with drugs. One girl's uncle was a shaman. Rachel got up and stoked the fire in a small black furnace. Even in August, the Alaskan summer nights were chilly. She began to sing about Jesus. Naturally shy, she didn't like to sing, especially by herself. But the song sprang from her lips. As she sang, Rachel visited each bunk bed and prayed with each girl. Finally, the girls fell asleep. After that, Rachel sang every night and prayed with the girls. One night, as she made the rounds, she asked a girl if she had any prayer requests. Yes, I want to pray to be safe and protected, the girl said. Safe from what? Rachel asked. The girl said that in the darkness of the previous night, someone grabbed her by the neck. As she struggled to breathe, a bright light appeared, and the unseen being released his grip. In the bright light was an angel, and he said, Do not be afraid. Peace immediately swept over the girl. She fell asleep and hadn't mentioned the incident to anyone until she spoke to Rachel. After Rachel prayed with her, 
the girl became more interested in Jesus for the remainder of her time at camp. She was a quiet girl who didn't say much, but clearly a seed was planted in her heart. Rachel was delighted when the girl returned to camp to train to become a staff member a few years later. Rachel Carl, who now teaches at an Adventist school in Sitka, Alaska, still volunteers at Camp Polaris, the place where she witnessed the reality of the great controversy between good and evil as a young counsellor. Working in Polaris has shown me that there are people in the United States who do not know Jesus, she said. Working at this camp was why I decided to become a teacher in Alaska. Thank you for your 2016-13 Sabbath offering that helped repair and expand Camp Polaris so more children could attend. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a centre of influence at the Adventist Church in Bethel, Alaska. The Bethel Church sends local children to Camp Polaris every year.